Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg from the Allstate Studios in Chicago on 720 WGN. And as I did foretell you just a few minutes ago, our guest tonight is Caroline Glick, uh, who is described as an American-Israeli journalist for Mako Rishon and is the deputy managing editor of the Jerusalem Post and is as well a senior fellow for Middle Eastern Affairs at the uh, Washington, D.C.-based Center for Security Policy. Those are the major identifying credentials, are they not? Um, I guess so, a little bit out of date. but uh, Which part is out of date? Well, um, I'm the senior contributing editor to the Jerusalem Post, and I'm an adjunct fellow at the Center for Security Policy, and I'm the director of the Israel Security Program at the David Horowitz Freedom Center in Los ah. Angeles. And are you still writing in Hebrew for Makor? Uh, we showed, well, actually, now I run a website in, in Israel called Latma, uh, which uh, uh, I publish and edit, and uh, that's mainly where I'm writing now these days in Hebrew. Is from On that writing. website, you also have some comic scenes done right. by it's Israeli a, actors. Exactly. It's a satirical uh, uh, website. We do. And I checked it out today, but my Hebrew is is very slim. So we have English subtitles if people I want saw to get was, it. There were, there were dot I saw should, You should do, one, do it in Yiddish occasionally. Oh. That, that's, my Yiddish la- that's my Jewish language. I see. Let's get down to serious business. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is the situation in Israel? What's, what constantly stirs, stuns, and confuses me is that there's a significant anti-Zionist, thus anti-Israeli movement within Israel among the Jewish inhabitants of Israel. It's not the majority movement, but it's there. I think first it's important, before we even get to that, to discuss what's happening in Israel on the ground. We have, uh, over the past weekend, we've had over 100 mortars and missiles shot into southern uh, Israel from uh, 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 Hamas-run Gaza. And then Um, just the other day, or is it uh, yesterday, I guess, there was an attack on of the Golan Heights. Right, and today we sustained our third attack from uh, Syria on the Golan Heights. And um, for the first time since the 73 Yom Kippur War, Israel actually returned fire to yeah. Syria. We had a, we sent over a missile there uh, to, as a warning shot, essentially, to say, uh, please don't, <laughs> you know, don't, don't drag us into a war that you don't want. But it's, uh, the, the scene on the ground is extremely dangerous right now. Uh, Do you think that attack from... Syria onto the Golan Heights, which used to be Syria, but now is occupied by Israel, and Israel claims it as permanent territory. Right. Since uh, 1981. Do you think that that was a governmental, uh, a governmentally induced action, or just a maverick occurrence? Oh, no, I look. I think that it was. I think that it was uh, done by the Syrian government very purposefully because. Um, First of all, we have to recognize that in Syria there aren't really any good guys on the ground. The the uh, regime is uh, controlled and a satellite of Iran, and the rebels are essentially al-Qaeda. I mean, they are, they are radical, radical, radical Islamic jihadists. Mm. And so, you know, from Israel's perspective, there's, there's not a side here to support. And um, so the government has been shooting missiles into Israel, apparently in an attempt to drag it into a war, so that they can then rally the people of Syria behind it, saying, look, we're fighting the Jews, support us. The rebels, um, such as they are, uh, apparently uh, issued a, uh, an ultimatum against Israel after Israel uh, returned fire from the Golan Heights today after one of our military outposts was attacked um, and said that, it was, uh, that Israel was coming to the defense of Bashar Assad and that they had had the uh, government forces uh, around uh, Kunetra and the Syrian side of the Golan Heights uh, uh, encircled, and that because of the Israeli action uh, on behalf of Bashar Assad, the encirclement was uh, uh, called off or they failed or something like that. And so they're they're now saying that Israel is an ally of Assad because they're trying to rally the people to their side, saying that Bashar Assad... Iran's satellite in the Arab world is a friend of the Jews. It's all I am crazy. distressed to hear you say, as an abs- to, to assert as if it were an absolutely established fact, that the um, the opposition to the government of Syria, the opposition to Bashar Assad, the revolutionaries, if they're making a revolution, that they are Al Qaeda, pure and simple. I would have hoped that the case is they're a mixed group in a mixed bag. 
I'll put it this way. You mix Al Qaeda with anything and it's Al Qaeda. Why? Because they Why want that? because when you when you bring in this sort of uh element into any sort of an opposition, they're the most determined, they're the best organized, and um they have the easiest propaganda message to communicate to the people. Pure hatred. And so <sighs> You know, there's no such thing as as going to. It's like what they say. You know, uh, if you go to sleep with dogs, don't be surprised if you wake up with fleas. I mean, if if you're bringing Al Qaeda into your big tent, then they're going to take you over. Well, we, we could go in a thousand directions in this conversation. Good conversation uh, is free associative to some degree and doesn't just follow a narrow schedule all laid out. That's why That's we part- love you, Milt. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Therefore, this leads me to one free associative or one related matter that one should really discuss uh, at this point, because it, co- because it comes to my mind at this point. Are you saying that this is generally true by now of the so-called, uh, uh, the so-called Arab Spring? For example, and most particularly, since we've, uh, we're, we've been rather preoccupied with it lately, Libya yeah. and the opposition in Libya and the people who uh, attacked uh, the consulate in Benghazi. Uh, it is asserted by some they're Al Qaeda. Well, are they really? Are they? Or should one j- draw gradations? Should one call them jihadists? Should one call them rightists? Should one uh, modify and qualify a bit more? Look, or I, does all of it become Al Qaeda? I think it all. It, it's all. It all kinds of merges because, look, I mean, Al Qaeda is not the Lions Club. It's not. It's not a group that people pay dues and they join. I'm a dues paying member of Al Qaeda. It uh-huh. doesn't work that way. There is an ideology of jihad and there is an ideology that uh that uh, a Muslim if he wants to be devout then he has to uh he has to engage in a holy war against uh the non-Islamic world led by the United States with its uh outpost in Israel. And that okay, they have that menta- to, and that they have to kill Americans. That mentality is there, right? I, but there are many who tell you and assure you right. uh, that that mentality represents maybe five percent, maybe three percent of the total Islamic uh, population of the Middle East. It isn't the general view that one takes in with one's mother's milk or with uh, the Friday preachments of the Imam at the mosque. Right, so they're wrong. I mean, we look at the the, the, the electoral results in, in Egypt, and you have the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a jihadist organization dedicated— Is it? Do we know yeah, that? Very much so. It's their motto. It's their motto. Dying in the cause of, Asla, of Allah is our highest aspiration. Jihad is our way. The Quran is our constitution. I mean— could they be any more clear? The answer is, of course, no, they couldn't. But nobody wants to listen because nobody wants to recognize it. They won. And the party that came in second place are the people who want to out-jihad the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salafists. You know, I'm sure you've met and talked with a revered elder figure and considered to be one of the great Western uh, historians of Islam across the years and present-day expert on Islam. I speak, of course, of Bernard Lewis of, of Princeton University. Um, would he agree with you? Yeah, I believe so. I don't like to speak for uh, for Professor Lewis. I I have certainly uh, met him on a number of occasions, and we've discussed this. He's at been length, here on this program. He's once, certainly of capable of uh, presenting his own ideas better than I am. But I I cannot imagine for a moment that he would disagree with what I'm saying about the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, one of the things that uh, Israelis find inexplicable about uh, American uh, analysis of current affairs in the Middle East is is the American refusal to recognize the reality of the Muslim Brotherhood, that it is a jihadist organization that is genocidally anti-Semitic, that seeks the annihilation of the Jewish people, that seeks the destruction of the United States. But where do they actually say, uh, on a, in a printed word, we want to finish the job the Nazis did and kill all the living Jews. You know, they don't uh, say that, do they? Well, yes, they do, actually. Uh, Mohammed Morsi, the president of Egypt, has a rich history of making these kinds of remarks about Jews. And he makes it by quoting the scripture and uh, where the, the Quran calls uh, Jews the spoiled offspring of, uh, of monkeys and pigs and that uh, a rock will say, there's a Jew hiding behind me, oh, uh, soldier of Allah, come and kill the Jew. I mean, th- this is this is what he has said on any number of occasions over the course of decades, 
And this but people is, who disagree with you would say yes, and you find exactly opposite quotations also in the Quran. But those aren't the ones that he quotes. No, the, but Th- those aren't the ones that the president of Egypt is quoting. And sure. so, and so, yes. if he's not quoting them, then obviously they're not as important to him. We are well launched into an interesting conversation, and <laughs> it will continue, Director Raff, directly after we pause for these words. Extension seven twenty with Milt Rosenberg on seven twenty WGN. And we return to conversation with Caroline Glick. Uh, and clearly, I, one can summarize what you've been saying so far is that there is a mentality that you describe as a jihadist mentality. We can label it al-Qaeda. We can label it Muslim Brotherhood. We can label it in various ways. But it is there. It is pervasive. Was it always there to the same extent? Or has it been facilitated and fostered and stirred by a recent history? It was always there. It was it was repressed under the leadership in Egypt mm-hmm. of, uh, of of Hosni Mubarak in Libya of Muammar Gaddafi in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. Who, you know, they they embraced the Muslim Brotherhood and they imprisoned the Muslim Brotherhood at the same time. They 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 uh, in Egypt, uh, Hosni Mubarak allowed people mm-hmm. to have the outlet in the mosques and in the media to 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 spew. Uh, jihadist propaganda, but on the uh, by the same token, he disenfranchised them. So that you know, this was always the most powerful social force in Egypt. So the Muslim Brotherhood was established in Egypt in 1928. It was always the most in modern day Egypt. It was always the most uh, uh, important organizing force socially in Egypt. All of the major rulers came from it. Nasser came from it. Uh, uh, Anwar Sadat came from the Muslim Brotherhood, and so. You know, uh, it, but it didn't have political power. The thing is, is that once Mubarak was brought down, it was obvious to anybody who understood even anything about Egypt that the Muslim Brotherhood would rise to power. There was no alternative leadership in Egypt after Hosni Mubarak was brought down. If all of this is um, deeply and uh, accurate and and simply true and will persist as the real situation. Uh, the real politique reality, which has to be lived with, then how does Israel live with it? What is a reasonable Israeli uh, strategy or uh, diplomatic policy, or for that matter, security policy? Israel is very much in a bind right now because we have Hamas, which is a Muslim Brotherhood. It's a Palestinian mm-hmm. branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. They say so. They declare it openly in their charter from 1988, which is, again, openly genocidal and, and in fact, a Nazi-like in its portrayal of Jews. Does it say in the actual founding document our ambition is to end the Jewish state? No, not just end the Jewish state, to kill every Jew in the world. It does say that yes. much. And, I mean, it, 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 it couldn't be more clear. Well, it, yes, that's a form of rhetoric. That's no, but a it's, rhetorical it, purification. Right, yes, because you know, you know there, are, there are just constitutions all over the world cropping up saying that our supreme aim is to blot out an entire people. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is— There are constitutions— no, I'm I'm being facetious. I mean, it, this is a serious. This is serious. It's not just words. I mean, this is yes. this is this All is right. what they believe, and this is their article of faith, and they are self-declared the chapter of the Muslim Brotherhood yeah. in in uh, in among the Palestinians. Does and, Hezbollah to the north take the same position? Yes, but they're not. Uh, they're not Shiite. I mean, they're Shiites. They're, they're not Shiites. Sunnis. They're, they yeah. they come at it from the from the from the Iranian perspective, yeah. the Khomeiniist genocidal kill all the Jews perspective. So. Yes, Israel is surrounded by these groups, and Hezbollah is in charge of Lebanon. They control the government of yeah. Lebanon. And so, you know, from the south, we have a real problem because under Mubarak, we had a peace treaty with Egypt that meant that the southern border, which uh, is over 100 miles long, um, was a border of peace. Israel gave up the Sinai Peninsula in exchange for peace. We gave land away for peace, and we gave away with the Sinai our ability to defend ourselves from a ground invasion from Egypt. That was our strategic depth. It was the Sinai Peninsula. And now Egypt is taking away the peace, but we still don't get the Sinai. And so we lack this strategic depth. We Our military planning until the overthrow of Mubarak was based upon the assumption that uh, we wouldn't have to fight along the southern border. And now what we have is this war that that the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood is waging against Israel from Gaza with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rockets and mortars coming into southern Israel every day, or not hundreds every day, but we've had over 700 since the beginning of, uh, of 2012, and there's been a massive escalation in the past several weeks. 
And the question is, how does Israel respond? In the past, we could respond and defend ourselves against these kinds of attacks from Gaza without worrying that Egypt would see it as a cause of spelly and begin uh, moving troops into the Sinai or threatening Israel in other ways. And today we're facing that, that prospect. Why and how was the Israeli-Egyptian peace uh, accord ever, uh, ever managed? It, through deterrence, because Israel showed... No, but what was Egypt's motivation? Egypt's motivation was to get back to Sinai. And? And they did. But the Saddam's famous trip to Jerusalem seemed to promise Sadat. much more. Sadat's famous we, trip we, to Israel Jerusalem never got seemed any, to promise much more. Israel never got anything more. I mean, we had a cold peace, which is really more like a cold war with Egypt all of these years. But a cold war is, uh, is, uh, is more advantageous than a hot one. And Sadat got two things from his peace with Israel. He got uh, the Sinai Peninsula, which was huge, and he uh, got massive amounts of U.S. aid, specifically military aid. I mean, when you look at the Egyptian military that fought Israel in 1973, it was based on Soviet military platforms, tanks, planes, ships, anti-aircraft batteries, missiles. Um, and today it's an American fighting force. Their, their pilots are trained by the United States Air Force. They have F-16s as their main uh, fighter jet. Their Navy is based completely on American platforms. It's more powerful than the Israeli Navy. I mean, you're talking about a completely different military, and it is a much, much, much more powerful military than the one that Israel faced in 73. Basic question. Why don't all the Israelis who face the same problems, who see the same uh, missiles coming in from the south, and see uh, and uh, are aware of the same threats from Hezbollah and hear the same kill the Jews rhetoric from many different uh, significant satraps of the uh, of the Muslim Arab world. Why don't they all share your view? Why are there, in fact, in Israel, uh, it's not quite the majority, but still a sizable uh, body of commitment, a sizable body of opinion, which may run to 30 or 40 percent of the total Jewish population of Israel, favoring, quote, a two-state solution as soon as possible. And even some who argue for a unified single state in which you have a significant return of uh, lots of Palestinians to live in Israel, even though that suggests, in terms of uh, possibly demographic projection, ultimately an Arab majority in uh, the re- the remainder of the state of Israel. There are Jews, Israeli Jews, who essentially take that view. They're also strongly represented by many supporting Jewish organizations in the United States. One might only need only mention J Street as the most recent one. Look, I mean, there are a lot of issues that you just threw out at me. I'm so, so, yes. uh, so I'm just going to take a yeah, couple of them. Apart. You know, the the the, the reason why there why there is an Israeli left is because. Hope springs eternal. You know, I mean, look, we, we face extraordinary problems. We, I mean, risks that would really, you know, that, that would make any anybody trying to figure out a strategy for uh, deterring enemies and for survival uh, get a headache. It's very difficult. Israel is located in a very difficult place, and, and it's become more difficult over the recent years. And so... One way, means of coping with this is to deny it or to project all of the evil that, that is being espoused by Israel's e- neighbors onto Israel because if it's our fault, then we can do something about it. You know, if, if, if we can blame ourselves for other people's bigotry, then we can appease them and we can do something about it. So in a way, you know, this, this kind of viewpoint is a coping mechanism for a very difficult and daunting position that Israel finds itself in. There's an ancient Roman maxim, indeed, it is sometimes uh, found uh, on, uh, uh, on military buildings as a, as a sort of an inscription as you enter. Uh, Desiderat pacem preparat bellum. Mm-hmm. If you desire peace, prepare for war. Yeah. But the further implication is if you desire peace, you've got to fight an occasional war yeah. to get their attention and to make clear that you have retaliatory or uh, preemptive capability, uh, which has to be respected and has to be remembered. You're saying that's Israel's situation. That's Israel's situation. Look, it's not just the Romans who said. I mean, it's in the Bible. It's uh, one mm. of the one of the prayers that Jews utter in the synagogue every day, which is, "God gives strength to His people. God blesses people with with peace." I mean, you can't. And you know, Reagan said it then: "Peace through strength." The same thing. I mean, this is as old as time. This understanding that freedom 
is not free, that you have to be willing to defend it and fight for it, otherwise you'll lose it, and that peace is based upon being strong. Not a, when you're weak, you invite aggression. But consider the real situation of Israel. It's a, a little sliver of land uh, at the east end of the Mediterranean, surrounded by uh, vast, vast Muslim populations, uh, w- which will rise, uh, which will rise in terms of technological achievement and rise in terms of, of they've got a lot of wealth, some of them, others don't, uh, but uh, they have manpower, they have increasing technological capability. It's quite likely that one of those powers, not Arab in nature, but truly Islamic all the same, namely, of course, Iran, will have nuclear weapons fairly soon. Uh, what's the long-range prediction for the stability of Israel? The Crusader state, uh, so-called, lasted in Israel for about, lasted in that part of the world where present Israel is for about 100 years and ultimately was overwhelmed and disappeared. Uh, is that the, going to be the ultimate fate of Israel? No. no Why not? It's not? Look, I mean, it, it, because we're not the Crusaders. We're not, we're not foreigners in our land. We're the Jews. This is, this is just where we're from. This is, we came home in an unprecedented act of uh, human ingenuity and courage after 2,000 years of exile. I mean, it's, it's not going to go away. We're not going to lose it this time. And, you know, uh, I mean, Winston Churchill used to quip that the Americans always do the right things after they've exhausted all the other alternatives. And, you know, the Jews will fight when we have to. I mean, the, we don't want to. We are a peace-seeking nation. We always have been, and we've always tried very hard to get along with everybody, whether at home or abroad. And that doesn't mean that we're going to get pushed around till the end of time. I mean, you, you, you ask a very valid question. How can you account for these Israeli anti-Zionists who are really – And many, American Jewish anti-Zionists. Well, American Jews is, is a completely different story. And the, How do you explain the Israelis? Part of it is because they're extremely well paid by the Americans and the Europeans to say these kinds of things. You know, if you if – you, if I, I always say that if I – I wanted to get the Pulitzer. All I have to do is write one anti-Israel article, and then uh, uh-huh. everybody would be so shocked that they'd give me all the prizes. We're in mid-course on a very difficult and very important <laughs> set of questions, which I mean to uh, continue with. I will just point out, as we are about to pause for an update on the news, <clears throat> that the single nation which carries the greatest potential immediate uh, material threat, material in the sense of a destructive capability, is, of course, Iran, if they go forward uh, to make nuclear weapons. And uh, the question of what to do about Iran and will Bibi Netanyahu, a man you have worked for, will he ultimately undertake to let loose the Israeli forces, at least the Air Force and what else I don't know, uh, to uh, try to destroy the nuclear installations? And what might the consequences of all of that be? And what is the American interest in these matters? That's an interesting nut to begin to crack open, as we shall do in continuing conversation with Carolyn Glick right after the update on the evening's news. Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. Well, I've plunged into an awful lot of stuff, and you've been very kind to tolerate my raising all of these issues. But I guess the basic question, if we can narrow down a little bit right now, is Iran. Uh, will Israel attack Iran? If so, what kind of attack would it be? Does it need American permission? Should it attack Iran? So I think to start with the last question, I don't see any uh, – uh, to start with your last question, I don't, I don't actually see any option other than, than military on, today. Um, the sanctions have been completely ineffective. Even the crippling sanctions that have been levied against Iran in recent years have not had – any impact whatsoever on their nuclear position, on their nuclear installations, on their nuclear advancement. Um, the only people who have actually suffered from those sanctions is the, is the Iranian people who want to overthrow the regime. So, you know, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. In, in Iran, it's the mullahs getting closer and closer to the nuclear bomb and the people of Iran becoming more and more repressed. Just today, Olmert or somebody in Israel said that, they've, that Iran has slowed down. Uh, you know, so... I mean, that, the, then on the other hand, the Sunday Times reported that they've fast, you know, they've moved up the pace. I don't, you know, these, these stories, day-to-day tracking, are completely irrelevant because the fact of the matter is that their pace towards nuclear capabilities has been inexorable and always moving in, in, the, forward, in the forward direction. So if you want them to not acquire the means to, uh, to conduct nuclear war, 
then you have to do something else to stop it. And so far, all of the tools of statecraft, short of war, have failed and failed completely and uh, and are only facilitating the Iranian regime's acquisition of nuclear capability. It does seem to me unlikely that a preemptive air assault by Israeli forces could really knock out all of the nuclear warfare potential of Iran. There are some 15 to 20 different locations uh, where this, this stuff is being developed and done. Uh, also, undoubtedly, they are deeply shielded underground with heavy concrete uh, surround, and uh, even blockbuster bombs can't really take care of all of it. Uh, nuclear missiles probably could, but obviously Israel isn't going to throw nuclear weapons against another nation unless it's doing so in retaliation for having received such an assault. First of all, I think that you know you have to you have to define what a preemptive attack is. Iran is attacking Israel on a daily basis through Hamas, through Hezbollah, yes. through the Syrians. So, you're talking about a preemptive attack from a country that's under attack by another state, um, because you finally say, okay, let's let's take our let's take our attack to the to the root, as opposed to the branch. Um, I'm not sure that I would necessarily define that as preemptive. But aside from that, look, I. I I I really dislike these discussions about what would an attack look like because I have no idea. I'm not running the boards on this. I don't know. I mean, I do know that there's more than one way to skin a cat. I know that all of the ways that they've tried to skin a cat, and specifically this cat of the Iranian nuclear installations and nuclear program, one last uh, have, way was have, mess up their computers. Have have failed, you know, and and well, that so, messed up their know. computers thing supposedly set them back. About a, a couple year. of years. Yeah, well, look. And that was an Israeli American operation, was it not? According to the Obama administration's leaks to the New York Times, they were. But, yes. you know, I, I mean, the, the, the point of the matter, which of course tipped off the Iranians, which was brilliant. But, um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't. The only way that you can truly stop the Iranian uh, sprint to nuclear uh, capabilities is by overthrowing the regime. Short of that, all you can do is fight a delaying action unless, like you said, you're willing to, to, to use very, very harsh means to, to end it. And at least that's what it seems to me. But again, I'm not in, I'm not in uh, possession of this information. And if I were, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be on the radio talking about it. So, you know, I, I think all of these discussions are interesting on a theoretical basis, but practically speaking, they're, they're of limited value. All I can tell you for sure is that every means that has been employed to date, uh, short of war, short of military actions, has not uh, stopped Iran. And, you know, we, I think it's very important to understand why Iran has to be stopped because everybody says, what's Israel going to do? We forget what Iran is. Iran is a terrible destabilizing, terrorist-supporting... All right. Then I think what I hear you saying, tell me if I misperceive, is that, yes, inevitably, Israel will have to do a military attack against the nuclear installations in Iran. Look, I mean, I've been writing this since 2006, so yes. 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 I, I, I mean, I think that we had better opportunities to do it in the past than we have now, and with each passing day, the uh, the ability to... to, to uh, cause sustained damage to the Iranian program is diminished, as you said. So, I mean, we're not talking about something that we can do whenever we feel like it. It is something that is a matter of great urgency. Can it be done alone, that is, by Israel, or does Israel need not only American permission, but American assistance of some sort? Israel is a sovereign state. It doesn't need anybody's permission to prevent uh, itself from being annihilated. I would I would expect for the United States to support such an action since the United States supports Israel's continuing to exist. Um, you know, and and I think that we have to put it in those sorts of stark stark terms. Is it, is the United States going to uh, uh, oppose Israel taking steps to ensure that it uh, is able to survive? Because if so, that's interesting. Let's have a discussion about that. Well, I'll tell you what we need to discuss right now. We come to something which you've been saying in pieces you've written for the Jerusalem Post just over the last few days. You seem to be saying that the election, the re-election. President Barack Obama is bad news for Israel. Why? Because President Obama is not particularly fond of Israel. And, you know, he has spent the his first term in office making it very clear 
that he does not share the views of most of his predecessors that Israel is a, is an important ally to the United States. He has facilitated the rise to power of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt by uh, by uh, joining forces with uh, with others to call for and force uh, the resignation of Hosni Mubarak uh, immediately, without prevent and so preventing the military regime that had run Egypt since the 1950s from figuring out a way uh, to enable uh, more democratic participation in Egypt over time while preventing Egypt from transforming itself into an Islamic state, which is what it is today. And so, you know, he he did all of these things. And, of course, as far as the Palestinians are concerned, he he, he has uh, uh, called for... uh, Israel to return to its rump borders of the armistice lines that weren't borders, the armistice lines of 1949 that are indefensible uh, for the partition of Jerusalem, uh, the the uh, Israeli uh, surrender of uh, of the Temple Mount to the Palestinians uh, through the return to the 49 armistice lines. I mean, these are these are positions that no American president has taken in the past, and. Um, it's it's very disturbing, and of course, on Iran, he has continued to call for appeasement and more appeasement and more appeasement of the mullahs, while of course passing these sanctions. But as we've seen, they've had no impact on their nuclear program. So, you know, on the one hand, he's engaging the the Iranians in these negotiations, which now the latest reports say they don't even have to stop enriching uranium in order to strike a so-called grand bargain with the Americans, which means that the United States under Obama seems to be okay with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the regime having, uh, he, having the basis for a nuclear weapons program. I have not been to Israel for, for the last 20 years. You should come. Uh, I should come. I wish I were able to uh, manage it. Have you over for <laughs> dinner? Yes, by all means. I'll order out. From where? <laughs> a good restaurant. I'm sure. <laughs> Could be a good Arab restaurant, as a matter of fact. Sure, there's an Arab village right by my house. Yeah. They have great hummus. But I men- I mention that because I really wonder what the texture of daily life is like, and I wonder Fabulous. whether people are people living in security or are they burdened by a sense of a Damoclean sword over their heads. The question needs to be further addressed. Uh, is it really possible to be a happy and um, future believing Israeli under these circumstances? And I shall persist with that. After we pause for this. Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. And uh, we return directly to Caroline Glick. I guess my last question was really a way of getting you to talk about what life is really like. And I don't mean, yes, people are happy. They do their work. They love each other. They have their kids. uh, They drink coffee in nice cafes. But is there a sense of futurity? And for that matter, is it a happy country? Or is it so laden with tension that that interferes with kind of doing the normal business of life? Israel is the happiest country in the world if you base happiness on, for instance, children. I mean, there's a a great writer, David Goldman, who wrote a book about uh, why civilizations decline, and he built this happiness index. And... uh, it was based on a number of factors, most important being uh, demography and children. And Israel, Israeli Jews specifically, have uh, more children than any other Western country. By far, it's an outlier, in fact, in that. Where What's we, the actual number? Three. Three children per family. Three per family. So it's 2.9 to My three. And, uh, in most of Europe, it's 1.2, which is way one. below... Uh, replacement level. And the United States is also going down to below two. Yeah. So, you know, Israel is this outlier, and it's a very, very happy country. And, uh, you know, Israel is really coming into its own now over just, I know you mentioned that I moved to Israel in 91, 20, 21 mm-hmm. years ago. And uh, it's really just become, it's come into its own. It's a matter of, uh, you know, how long does it take for a country to really start developing its own culture, its own um, identity after you have this massive ingathering of exiles from all over the world? Um, and you you see the development of a very extraordinary, very exciting Israeli character. We're becoming much more free market oriented, um, you know, you're much more of a meritocracy, 
We used to be much more of a socialist country Mm -hmm. uh, where you needed connections to get ahead, and now there's much more of a sense of... uh, Anybody can make it if you just work hard enough. George Gilder has done a very interesting book on it. It's about three or four years ago now. It's just been reissued, titled The Israel Test. Right. And that's the way of Westerners to test whether they understand what Israel is about. It's actually he, a test to see whether they're anti-Semites that's or not. Way, that's what, what he does say, to be sure. But at any rate, he points to the great entrepreneurial uh, revolution in Israel and the fact that it's gone very much in the direction, say, that Romney wanted to return to the United States. It's very much so. That's very much the case, that uh, is, as the United States becomes much more uh, a welfare state-bound, dependency-bound, Israel is becoming much less so, much more free market-bound, much more uh, based on, on liberty, much more religious also. The United States, apparently, I was hearing some demographic uh, explanations of what's happening in the United States, saying that today... You know, the United States has always been the m- most religious country in the free world, except for Israel, which was always sort of around where the United mm-hmm. States was in terms of religious observance. And now they said that just over the past decade, the number of people who regularly attend religious services or even say that they have a religion has gone down from whatever it was before to 80 percent, which was a 20 percent of Americans now claim that they don't have any religion. And you'll never get anything like that in Israel. Really? No, it's a much more religious country. The Zionist fathers of Israel were secular socialists. Right, certainly. and uh, their grandchildren are much more uh, much more religious. And when I say religious, I don't mean, you know, ultra-Orthodox. I mean... Um, but Reform Judaism is still not allowed in Israel, well, is it? Well, it's not that it's not allowed. There are Reform synagogues everywhere. It's just not popular. Uh-huh. Um, uh, Israeli Judaism is much more traditional. It, uh, I mean, that you have implants of Reform... Judaism and conservative Judaism from the United States, but they really don't take root in Israel very well because the population it didn't come from that kind of a cultural milieu. I mean, they're basically predicated on on either denying the divine nature of Jewish law or of saying, well, it's just a tradition, it's not divine, and most Israelis don't, don't look at it that way. The American Academy, I mean universities, mm-hmm. uh, tends to in the humanities and in certainly in the social science departments, tends to run leftwards. I've been talking about that on and off on this very program for many years, uh, and I belong to organizations which are concerned with that. I'm one of the founders of the National Association of Scholars, which is the main counter-leftist uh, sort of tradition-based or tradition-serving uh, ac- uh, organization of academics. Um, but in the main, the American university does run in that direction. So does the American press. So do American uh, broadcasting media, not to be sure American radio, which has produced uh, not only Rush Limbaugh but a number of other people who daily get on the air and kind of argue uh, conservatism, argue for conservatism. What's the situation in Israel in that regard? Well, it's very much influenced by the United States and Europe because, you know, we, we always uh, had in Israel the BTA has been to America as everybody needs to get their Ph.D. or their postdoc in America. Mm-hmm. You, know, you have a lot of professors who were trained in things like linguistics by uh, Noam Chomsky at MIT, and so you have a <laughs> lot of— Who've gone back to Israel? Yeah, well, you know, he's one of the great anti-Zionists. One of the great anti-Americans as well, and yeah. and you know, you you uh, you asked about the the anti-Zionist Israelis, and a lot mm-hmm. of it is bred in American and in European uh, academy, because uh, if this is if this is the trough that you're drinking from, this is what's coming out, and so yeah, and and the Israeli media as well. You know, you have a lot of people who studied at Berkeley and places like that, and they come back to Israel and they get their fellowships from places like the New Israel Fund and, and prizes and such. And it's, it's it's kind of a breeding ground for for, for that kind of Well, much of, if we come back to <clears throat> the internal politics. Much of that struggle between the right and the left in Israel is really over the question of how to settle with the Palestinians, is it not? I think, you know, that's sort of how it's perceived widely, but really it's about who has power in Israel and who's going to determine the character of Israel. And, you know, you mentioned 30 to 40 percent of Israeli Jews are, are much more appeasatory or, 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 or amenable to that sort of thing. But really you're only talking about about 15 or 20 percent at the most of the Israeli Jewish population that's interested in these sorts of things so from an ideological perspective. From a pragmatic perspective, you might get up to 35 percent. And um, who think that that's just 
probably the best way forward, but not out of conviction, rather out of just sort of surrender to to the, to the outside. But I think so much of this is just a culture war that you mentioned that a lot of the founding fathers in Israel were socialist and they'd like to remain in power, and yet they're a minority and they can't win elections any longer. Who's left? They're all gone except Perez, who's eighty nine, kicked up to the presidency. Which well, is you're merely... more talking about the, the children of these people, the people yeah. who were raised in uh, some of them in communist youth movements and and and, and uh, very left wing socialist youth movements who came came of age in the 1960s. And what you're really seeing with them is more of a culture war of what kind of country Israel <laughs> will be. First time I was in Israel, uh, the kibbutzim was still flourishing. In fact, my brother had just moved to Israel. Uh, and I'd moved to Israel about two years before, and he and his new wife were on a kibbutz. They had just left the kibbutz about the time we arrived uh, because he was taking a job with the agricultural ministry based in Haifa and running around the kibbutz team advising them. He only lasted four or five years, and he came back to get a doctorate in agricultural things in this country, and he got it, and he became a, uh, an agricultural scientist. So he remained in this country, but frequently going back to Israel. But in those days... First time I was there, Israel was a socialist country. Right, and now the kibbutzim that are flourishing are flourishing because they're privatizing all of their agricultural lands and selling it to real estate developers. So. There are no real kibbutzim anymore, then, are there? I, there are some, but you know, the, I think most of the agriculture in Israel, or a lot of the agricultural productivity is being mm-hmm. undertaken by more private farms. And they used to raise their kids in, in what do they call those crutches? Uh, the kids didn't live with their parents. They lived. No, in a, that was, in a but kid's that was house. abolished a long time ago. That was just ab- yes, it was cruelty. A, it was that a terrible, was horrible, stupid so thing to do. But, really stupid thing yeah. to do. <laughs> but for a while, there are lots of books written about it in an approving way. Well, you know, when you're trying to put forth a revolutionary and to a certain degree a totalitarian form of life, like for instance, surrendering surrendering your children to the group to the commune and having them reared, uh, reared by communal. In, in as a in a communal home for children, you have to put together a whole mythology about that sort of thing in order to legitimize yourself first and foremost in the eyes of your members. Because what sort of parent would ever want to, you know, transfer their children to the care of somebody else if they don't have to? We haven't talked about the Arabs of Israel, but of course they're they number over a million. What's the exact number? Close to about a million and a half, isn't it? No, it's about a million. About a million. And, we, of course, it's commonly said that they're in uh, various aspects of Israeli public life, but not in the military, are they? Well, there are. that's not true. There are Arabs in the military, and there are a lot of Bedouin. There are less than The Druze are very much uh, represented well, the Druze are a in, different the, matter, in the yes. military, and Arab Christians are represented in the military, and we just had our first Arab uh, Muslim woman who who uh, is serving, uh, who just finished an uh, officer course in the military. So that's not true. What we do see, unfortunately, is a radicalization of the Israeli Arab population. And the Bedouin, for instance, that I mentioned, the Bedouin of Israel, like the Bedouin of Sinai, like the Bedouin of Jordan, are undergoing a, a massive <laughs> radicalization um, by jihadists. And so you know, they used to be the most liberal factions in uh, in Israeli society, in Jordanian society, in Egyptian society, and now they are very much allied with al-Qaeda and uh, in Jordan and in Egypt and in Israel, they're, they're simply much more radical and uh, members of the Islamic movement. And so you know, we, had a, we had a number of Bedouin uh, soldiers in the IDF who have been killed in, uh, in uh, different operations over the past several years, and for the first time, they're not publicizing their names. No. Because they don't want to endanger their families. The Druze are fascinating. I tend I visited with them years and years ago, on the various times I've been in Israel, particularly in their villages up on Mount Carmel, mm-hmm. uh, north of Haifa, beautiful, or rather west yeah. of Haifa, uh, and they are of course uh, a uh, a religious uh, community descended from the Shia, but with some great differences, many of which are esoteric and one never really knows finally what they believe. It's a fascinating country, if only for the mix of cultures. Um, and uh, one wants it to survive. I do, and surely you do. And you're spending your life uh, in that mission, which I am not, but I look on with great interest. Um, but still, I have worries about it. 
Obviously, I'm more worried than you are. Which no, is you're not more worried surprising. than I am. But it's just that because I live in Israel, I'm very optimistic about the yeah. future because Israel is such an optimistic, forward-looking country. So, you know, when you when when you when you base your assessments on Israel on just what you read in the news and all the horrible things that are happening and just how difficult our strategic situation is. You know, it's very hard not to be pessimistic. But when you see that against the context mm-hmm. of an extraordinary country, a wonderful, exciting place to live in, a, a, the best place I can think of to raise children in the world, you know, you have a different assessment. What we must do, we're about to pause for an update on the news. When we return, what we must do is do what the diplomats call a tour d'horizon. We must <laughs> take a look at some of those other nations around and look a little bit more as, as to what... We know, or what Israeli specialists studying Egypt, studying, uh, for that matter, Jordan, studying uh, Syria in its present distress, uh, and Iraq and Iran and Lebanon and Tunisia, uh, and to be sure, uh, Libya. We need to just quickly run around and see whether um, you can shed any light as to where this Arab revolution, whether it's a jihadist one or otherwise, is ultimately going to carry that part of the world. We return then to Carolyn Glick. After the full update on the evening's news. Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg from the Allstate Studios in Chicago on 720 WGN. And so we return to Caroline Glick, uh, who is, among many other things, what's your present uh, title at the Jerusalem Post? The uh, Senior Contributing Editor. Senior Contributing Editor. Of course, you're on the Internet. You do a column just about every other day, but you've just taken... Uh, a hiatus, as I guess they say, because you're finishing a book. Right. right. So uh, I wrote my last column till the spring, I think, mm-hmm. uh, last Friday. And uh, now I have to... So if people want to check on your your recent columns, they can go to the website. They can go to the Jerusalem Post website or even to my own website. It's probably uh, carolynglick.com. Pretty simple, carolynglick.com. Right. I said I wanted to do a little bit of a tour of the horizon uh, concerning the state's around or in the neighborhood. Um, We've talked already about the Arab Spring, and you say it's all al-Qaeda, or it all turns into that kind of mentality. That's the kind that dominates and that tends to infect any other forces or any other uh, modes of thought uh, along which it exists. I hope that's not really true. I would hope that there is... I've, I've had some friends who are Arab intellectuals of one sort or another who have stood against what... Uh, presently represents what well, it's presently represented by al Qaeda or by Salafism and so on. I'd like to believe that that is a force that persists. That there are rational people out there. Of course there are, but they're not the majority, and they're not empowered. Um, you know, people were looking at the uh, the protesters on uh, the street in Cairo and Tahrir Square. Yeah. That were women who weren't wearing headdresses and men who looked like they were. You know, that they, that they were wearing blue jeans and all the rest Similar of protesters in Tehran about uh, three uh, but, years ago when they, they killed off the Green Revolution. Right, but what, what people were interpreting the, uh, the young people on the streets in Cairo as being was a majority. And that was completely untrue. They oh. were the thinnest, thinnest uh, veneer uh, in front of the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, and in Israel, we were trying and trying to warn, and we were warning and warning and telling the Americans, "Stop! What are you doing? This is not a this is not an organization. This is not a this is not a, a, a large constituency in Egypt, and these people don't have the capacity to um, to replace Mubarak. They will not replace Mubarak. They can overthrow him with the assistance of the Muslim Brotherhood and the United States government, but they cannot replace him." And um, nobody wanted to listen. Everybody wanted to believe that what they were seeing on the on the television screens was what was real. And then, you know, lo and behold, the day that Mubarak resigned, you had uh, CBS reporter Laura Logan getting gang raped in, in Tahrir Square by a bunch of people who think that women who are uncovered from head to toe in a burlap bag are whores. So, you know, th- this is this is the reality in Egypt that nobody wanted to acknowledge. And so you say, well, I would like to believe this. Of uh-huh. course, I know a lot of – I don't know a lot of, but I know several Egyptian intellectuals who are clearly uh, uh, pro-democracy, interested in peaceful coexistence with Israel and and uh, other other important things and, and interested in empowering women and giving women equal rights with men. 
but they are not the majority of Egyptians. They are not even a small minority. They're not even a significant minority in, in Egypt. And if you want to empower these people, this is a long process, and it involves serious work on the part of the United States. Israel is not in a position to do anything to advance this cause, but uh, the United States was in a position to do so after when when the revolt started against Mubarak and also in the years before that, and, and they didn't. And they didn't, and and they didn't want to choose winners and losers, which means that if you're not choosing, if you're not trying to tip the scales in order to to, uh, support people who support you and share your interests, at least to some degree, then what you're doing is actually tipping the scales in favor of the people who don't share any of your values. I think of one particular country, which after a while also looked very promising in terms of uh, its getting beyond the usual split and the usual uh, alienation towards Israel. I'm not talking about Egypt. I'm talking rather about Jordan. Yeah. What happened there? Jordan as well is different. I mean, you, you, a couple of things have happened in Jordan. Uh, first of all, the Arab, so-called the Arab Spring, the Islamic winter or otherwise known, um, happened. But before we get into that, Jordan is a country that basically has three population groups. They have the Hashemites, who are the ruling minority. They, they originated in, in Arabia. And they were in charge of the mosques in Mecca and Medina before the Sauds came in and took them over from them during World War One. Um, and they were brought in by the British. Basically, it, it's a long, drawn-out story, but as a consolation prize because the British were supposed to give them Syria and they didn't get Syria, so they got they got transferred. That's represented not totally, uh, totally inaccurately in the film Lawrence in Arabia. Is that right? You know, I didn't yeah. see the movie, but yeah. that that's that's basically what happened. And so there are foreign implants, and they represent a minority of the population. The next largest population group in in Jordan are the Bedouin. And as I said earlier, the Bedouin used to be very, very, uh, relatively speaking, uh, liberal, um, not particularly religious, uh, the most willing to cooperate with Israel. um, And they also manned the Arab Legion under Glob Pasha. Right, but I'm talking about in later times uh, because they were the worst, uh, they they were the most uh, dangerous fighters in in the Arab armies that Mm -hmm. invaded Israel in 1948, but I'm talking about more in the 1960s and 70s. And then, uh, and then you had the majority of the Jordanians who are Palestinians. And somewhere between sixty and seventy percent of Jordanians are, are ethnic Palestinians, and uh, so the the coexistence, such as this is between Israel and, and Jordan, has always been between Israel and minority of Jordanians, specifically the Bedouin and the Hashemite. And the Bedouins have now become even more radicalized than the Palestinians are, and so. Uh, the Hashemites are having a very hard time trying to maintain their peace treaty with Israel. They just sent a new ambassador to Israel as a Bedouin, and he was uh, disavowed by and, and excommunicated, essentially, by his Bedouin tribe for having gone, which is in many ways a fate worse than death for, for a Bedouin to be excommunicated from his tribe. It means that he has no identity any longer uh, because he refused to refuse the appointment. Um, and they're really uh, teetering on the edge of an abyss. And the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists in Jordan have been massively empowered both by what happened in Egypt and also by what's happening in Syria. And you have Jordanian jihadists who are going to Syria to fight against Assad and coming back. And uh, so y- you have a very, very serious position going on, situation going on in, in Jordan. And, and it's quite likely that the Hashemites will be overthrown. In fact, it's much more likely than not that they will be overthrown. Uh, within a year. So the king will... Be gone. Be gone. Yeah. Could they own some real estate in Bethesda, Maryland, so who knows if yeah. they there. <laughs> uh, we're about to pause for an update, or rather simply for a round of commercials, and then on to the phones. It is time to invite telephone calls. Of course, uh, the lines are now open. The number, as ever, 312-591-7200. 312-591-7200. I'll get your calls in instantly because we'll be with you instantly. For any question you have about uh, Israel, about uh, the Middle East, about the matters we've been discussing with Caroline Glick of the Jerusalem Post uh, and of the Center for Security Policy, at which she is a fellow, occasionally visiting them, I guess, in Washington. But basically, of course, she is resident in Jerusalem and used to be resident right here in Hyde Park, Chicago, from whence she comes. 312 591 7200. If you're listening to us on the internet, wherever you are in the world, and want to reach us, the email address extension720 at wgnradio.com. 
extension 720, as one word, at WGNRadio.com, on to your contributions right after this. This is Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. Our guest tonight is Caroline Glick, (coughs) and uh, she is, as I've said a few times, very important at the Jerusalem Post, which is an English-language newspaper, right? Some people may not realize that. Uh, And uh, you can find it regularly just on the Internet, or you can subscribe to it. Uh, And it's fascinating stuff. I just recently had a chance to talk to the man who was once the publisher of the Jerusalem Post, Lord Black. Uh, But uh, he's long since uh, gone to other pursuits and other locations. Uh, 312-7200 is the number, and we look forward to your calls. We've got room available on the board. Get in there with anything you want to ask or assert about uh, Israel, about the Middle East, about the Arab Spring or Revolution, or call it what you will. Um, And you don't have to agree with us to uh, give us a call. Uh, We have room available on the board. I want my friends to get in there quickly and give us some interesting commentary. And and indeed, commentary is acceptable. It doesn't have to be a question. It can be uh, your own view of things, uh, though rather briefly presented. 312 591 7200. The first caller is Juan. And good evening, sir. You're on the air. Uh, yes, I'm Carolyn. I'm not sure if you received my call. I just got a question, and I'll throw the question at you, and, and you answer it, and I'll just hear from from the radio. I'm a Christian, and, and um, I believe on six, Ezekiel 38 talks about at the end times there will be a Arab confederation of states attacking Israel. And sir, could you talk a bit more slowly, because we're not understanding everything you're saying. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm a Christian, and in the Bible, Ezekiel 38, it talks about at the end times. Yes. There will be an Arab confederation attacking Israel. And apparently at that time, Israel will be by herself to defend herself. Um, miraculously, uh, Israel will defeat the Arabs. I, I want your take to see if this is the time. Do you actually believe that this is coming? on the death scenario. I see. So you're dealing in the eschatology of the New Testament. I don't think there's any mention of Arabs in the New Testament. Uh, The Arab nation had not yet been sort of formed with that identity. But still, to be sure, uh, there is a a view in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Revelation, uh, according to John, that uh, at the end there will be uh, uh, great combat and great destruction. destruction, And Armageddon is uh, the place where it will happen. Well, I, I mean, I think that uh, Israel is is a nation alone, and we always have uh, fought by ourselves. Nobody has ever fought at the side of Israel. Um, and uh, so to that extent, uh, past is prologue, and um, I don't see anything new here. Um, so I'm not I, – I, I don't – I certainly can't comment on uh, timelines that are not uh, terrestrial uh, and uh, – uh, the Bible says something about the future that we've experienced uh, for thousands and thousands of years in our past. But you know what's interesting there is, of course, <clears throat> that a lot of American Christian support for Israel comes from fundamentalists who uh, yeah, and God bless them who favor Israel because it is <clears throat> as they interpret the Book of Revelation and uh, other uh, such premonitory wor- uh, portions of the New Testament and even one in the Old Testament. Uh, they uh, see Israel's coming conflict with its enemies as somehow uh, predicting or speeding along the coming of the end time when Jesus Christ will manifest himself again in the second coming, which will utter, which will enter, uh, usher in the millennium, leading ultimately to the, the final judgment and so on. That's taken much more seriously by American fundamentalists than it is any place else in the world. Well, the thing that I I find uh, disturbing is that uh, American Jews are so uh, troubled by this uh, to such a large degree and uh, and are fearful, uh, according to them, of uh, the Christian uh, evangelical support for Israel because because of the view uh, among Christians, and not only fundamentals, uh, fundamentalists, but that uh, the Messiah is Jesus. And what I say to that is everybody's entitled to their own beliefs, and... If you believe in Judaism, then you should not be threatened by other people's beliefs because 
obviously everybody who uh, has religious beliefs uh, is serious about them. So I, I don't see any reason why anybody should be threatened by other people's beliefs so long as you're strong in your own. Some American Jews have <clears throat> not been threatened but offended because they say what well, really uh, the uh, end times view taken by American fundamentalists is that uh, all the Jews will perish except those who at the last moment well, they, convert to Again, I, I don't think that uh, Judaism has ever been a, a religion that is about telling people what they can or cannot believe, and I think that everybody has a right to believe what they want to so long as they're not taking it into their own hands and saying, well, you know, like Ahmadinejad says, that uh, the, the uh, Shiite Islamic uh, uh, Messiah is going to come after an Armageddon, mm -hmm. and that in that Armageddon, all of the Jews are going to be killed. And in order to hearken the coming of of the Shiite Messiah, he wants to annihilate the Jewish people. So that is not a position that is taken by fundamentalist Christians at all. So uh, their belief in and of itself is not mine, and their view of the Messianic era is not mine, and that's okay. Back to the phones, 312-591-7200. Next up is... Uh, is Nick, who joins us at WGN Radio. Good evening, sir. Hi, thanks. And uh, I wanted to ask Ms. Glick, um, I, I'm concerned about the isolation we're, we're placing uh, in, on Israel. Our president, of course, snubbed uh, the prime minister and then uh, actually snubbed the Israeli people as well. And I don't think Israel can rely on the United States anymore. And if that's the case, uh, what what do you think the Middle East would look like if Israel had to capitulate to anybody else in the Middle East. And, of course, the U.S. is not going to come to their aid. No, I don't think that Israel is going to capitulate to anybody. But, look, the, the Middle East without a strong American superpower in the region is a much more dangerous place. There's no doubt about it. American power uh, for the past 40 or 50 years in the Middle East has been a stabilizing influence on the Middle East. And Waning American power in the Middle East is a recipe for destabilization and violence and more and more wars, and that is what we're seeing today. Um, and so uh, because of the waning American influence and power in the region, the likelihood of, of war uh, has risen. Um, do, you, do you lay that at the feet of our president? In large part, yeah. I mean, I think that this was something that was begun by the Bush administration because they the the, the – war that they fought in Iraq, which, you know, I was embedded with the 3rd Infantry Division, and uh, today's Veterans Day, and it's really important to salute the incredible bravery and skill of, of the American soldiers and what they did in Iraq and what they're still trying to do in Afghanistan is is certainly worthy of everybody's uh, respect and high regard, highest regard. Well, and I'm I, not a Jew, but I am concerned that uh, uh, Israel will become so isolated that no help from the United States will be of any benefit to her. And, and I, I'm, I'm ashamed of that. Well, Thanks. I, thank you very much for your support for Israel. And I don't think that uh, you know, the United States is – the United States may develop a foreign policy that's more similar to Europe, but I don't see the United States uh, and Israel stopping uh, all cooperation in, in, in the foreseeable future. Well, I, I hope not. Thank you. Thank we you. Thank you, sir, for the call. We thank you for the call, and we will – um, take another or two a little bit later on. Uh, right now, indeed, I uh, put out a call for calls. Uh, we're interested in uh, first-rate contributions, and most of our listeners are capable of that. But we're a little bit light on calls. That's usually the case on a Sunday well, night. Can I, can I take advantage of that and just complete the thought that I wanted to Please share do, with yes. Nick, which was about uh, what happened in Iraq? Because uh, when the United States decided that uh, it wanted to enable the Iraqi people to choose freedom mm -hmm. after Saddam's overthrow. Um, they did a number of things, some of which were excellent, like the counterinsurgency that defeated al-Qaeda in, in, uh, in western Iraq and that was going after the Shiite uh, militias in southern Iraq. But um, some of the things that they did were, were, were very uh, deleterious to the cause of liberty in Iraq and in, and in general, which was that, again, just to go back to what I was mentioning about Egypt, that the United States was simply not supporting its own allies. It wasn't cultivating the forces inside of Iraq that were truly pro-American. Um, and it was standing by and, and doing nothing as Iran was actively cultivating its own allies What should Iraq. it have done? 
it should have supported its friends and fought its enemies. And fighting enemies is not just about uh, um, defeating them on the battlefield. It's always about fighting the war of ideas. But and who were its friends? Well, there were people in uh, in in Iraq, and, and I'm just thinking of one person whose name is on the tip of my tongue, and I suddenly forgot it. Both of his sons were assassinated following a visit that he held in Israel, and uh, he participated in a counterterrorism conference in Tel Aviv. And when he got back to Iraq, there was a there was a couple of assassination attempts against him, and he and his children were killed. And um, he was elected to the Iraqi parliament as the head of a party uh, that was pro-American, pro-peace with Israel, and extremely liberal. And the United States didn't give him any support. And um, he's still in the parliament, to the best of my knowledge, but there, he's only there, one voice. And this is somebody, these are the kinds of forces that were waiting for the United States to support is them, the and they didn't Shia, get any. Is the Sunni-Shia division in Iraq essentially a pro- and an anti-American division? No. Uh, it's not. Uh, there are Shiites in Iraq, just like there are Shiites in Lebanon who are pro-Israel, that hate the Iranians and hate the whole Khomeiniist way of looking at Shiism. And just as there are pro-Israel and pro-American Shiites in Iran. Um, and there are also Shiites in Iraq who hate Iran because of the Iran-Iraq war, where the Iranians were just hell on wheels. I mean, not that Saddam's Iraq was any better, but that they, they hate him because of that. So, no, it's not specifically an anti-American or pro-American, but there are a lot of forces inside of Iraq that owe their power to Iran. It is time now for uh, our friends to get in there with some good questions and comments. The lines are open, 312-591-7200. Get in there right now, if you would. We're about to pause for an update on the news. This is Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. As we return to Carol and Glick, and we'll go directly back to the phones. There is still some room available on the board. We'd love to hear from some people who've got experience of the Middle East. Surely our Palestinian listeners are invited to join in this conversation, as well as Israeli listeners, as well as Americans, Jewish and or otherwise. As they used to say in a great advertising slogan, you don't have to be Jewish to enjoy Levy's rye bread. You don't have to be Jewish to uh, get in on this conversation tonight. 312-591-7200. 312-591-7200. Next up is Frank, and yes. you are on the air, sir. Good evening. Well, thank you. Uh, first, uh, I'm not Jewish, Mel. All right. <laughs> okay. However, uh, I... I think, Car- I think Caroline is, by the way. And this is addressed to your young lady there. Yes. Uh, that we have such a tremendous amount of... Uh, and I want to say he despises, because Obama's gone out of his way to... Uh, support the Brotherhood and to uh, push uh, Muslim activities. Well, on, on what basis? Do, hold on. On what basis do you say that? I say that because first, uh, let's take a look at Egypt, where he gave them two, three billion, actually over two billion dollars mm-hmm. uh, to the Brotherhood, because that's all that's run in Egypt to keep their country, their government, the supposedly freeloaders, as I want to call them, alive and 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 operating and in the meantime they're going out of their way to destroy any connections they run forward but if you take a look at it they were out there uh the muslim brotherhood have uh, shot christians they run them over with tanks they turn around there and and they claim that they're supporting the border but they seem to be having a lot more problems with that border now that they're in charge than there was under mubarak well it is true that the coptic christians of egypt are um, suddenly under significant attack. Exactly. And uh, many, many of them are getting out, yes. And along with that, to take a look at Libya. I mean, come on. Benghazi is a prime example of a case of uh, total corruption. We knew what was going on. And in my opinion, this is only mine, that they wanted our ambassador there to be captured so they could trade him for our blind cleric, which is what the... Brotherhood has been asking for us mm-hmm. to release. Yeah, the man who did the first assault against the um, the uh, the International the Trade World Center Trade in New York, and the World Trade Center. Now, but, but my real question is, and this is you know, that that's just setting the stage of why under our current president we seem to have really drifted extremely to the uh, direction of supporting the Brotherhood. Uh, is why is it that in the United States? The liberal Jewish group 
and I'm talking about Springsteen, I'm talking about that whole bunch up there, is supported Obama when they know that he seems to be dead set at making sure that well, Israel gets wiped off the surface of the I earth. I must tell you that conservative Jews, whether they're American conservative Jews or Israeli conservative Jews, as uh, to be sure Caroline is, well, she's both. She's from oh, America, but has been in Israel for 20 years and clearly is of a conservative disposition, tend to be rather uh, rather unhappy about and rather critical towards um, the American Jewish community, which to some 70 or greater percent uh, voted for Obama this last time around and generally has been on the liberaloid side with regard to American politics for an eternity, or at least for the last uh, 70 years. or 80 years. Yes. So your response, Caroline? I mean, I I think that uh, I agree. I I share your frustration. I, what, what can I tell you? You know, it, it's it, I I find it. Um, you could try to explain very, it. Very disturbing. Look, the, the explanation that you have. There are lots of different explanations, but I think uh, one of the explanations is that when you're setting your priorities, and when a lot of these American Jews are setting their priorities, Israel's not among the top ten. And so, you know, they, they, I don't understand why they have a fixation with abortion. I don't understand why so many American Jews have a fixation with homosexual marriage. I don't understand why they have a fixation with taxing themselves or with things like uh, affirmative action, which makes it um, increasingly difficult for their children to get into uh, top universities or get jobs. So I don't understand why they're, why they're betting against themselves in so many of these things. I don't okay. understand it at all. I, I find it very disturbing, and and I can only describe a reality as I see it. I can't. Uh, I can't. I don't justify it, and uh, I don't identify with it. And um, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten this questions. I, it's and I and it's very. It's always frustrating to me, as if for the first time when I get it, because I share the frustrations of the questioner, um, and uh, that's. I think that's about it. Well, uh, I apologize. I was hoping you could enlighten me because I'm not Jewish. <laughs> well, I mean, look, you know, you, why why would Catholics vote for for a president? Seventy three percent of Catholics, I think, voted for Obama when he's making it mandatory for Catholic hospitals to provide birth control and abortion for people who they are they are treating. I mean, this this is the kind of imposition of uh, of uh, constraints on religious freedom that is unheard. See, I have an answer for that. What is it, sir? Because they're they're stupid. They're not ignorant. They're stupid. Well, another, they're another kind of answer is Obama phone. another kind of answer is that they're intelligent, as people generally are rather intelligent. And if you're intelligent, you're not a single issue person. You may be invested in a number of different kinds of major public issues, uh, and quite possibly the um, uh, the uh, interdiction against abortion, as from within the Catholic Church and in Catholic uh, dogma, is uh, not as important to them as. Uh, certain economic issues, which they think are about to be properly handled by a second round of no. the Obama administration, I don't necessarily agree with them, but I think oh, okay. it's perfectly I was say because you know there's not going to be a, a, a unless you're looking to become a freeloader. There's no way in the world the Obama administration is going to help you. Well, we shall see. Thank you, sir, for the call. Okay, thank very, you. very glad to have heard from you. Quickly to another on three one two five nine one seventy two hundred, and next up is Steve. Good evening, sir. You're on the air. Hi. Uh, always a great show. Thank uh, you. My sense is is that the Iranians have already constructed a nuclear device. And secondly, <clears throat> I'm curious as to if there is going to be an attack on Iran, will it be air-based or will various governments actually land rapid deployment forces at the various uh, Iranian nuclear sites. Look, I mean, the, 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 again, the open source information that we have is, according to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, that the Iranians will um, be past the no point of no return in the sense of the, the, any military strike having diminishing uh, rewards um, to a very significant degree by the spring. So, I don't know what they have or what they don't have. I'm not privy to that uh, classified information. And again, if I were privy to that classified information, I wouldn't be at liberty to mention it on the radio. Um, as to what sort of strike and how a strike would look, again, you know, there are a lot of different scenarios. 
uh, that have been discussed, that are discussed, whether it's a military, whether it's a aircraft, uh, air, air force strike against uh, aerial bombing against against Iran's nuclear installations, particularly the Nantaz uh, uranium enrichment uh, facility, uh, the Boucher nuclear reactor that was built by the Russians, um, or whether it would be through other means, including an electronic pulse uh, uh, device, uh, an EMP attack. Um, it's possible. Um, a lot of things are possible. It's possible uh, to land commandos. It's possible that commandos are already there. I don't know. It's possible that Iranian agents would do it. All of these things are within the realm of possibilities, and um, I would I would like to hope, you know, that any attack would have elements of all of these things in order to maximize its effectiveness. But it, I'm not playing the boards on this, so it's impossible for me to don't you think comment that, intelligently. Don't you think it's quite likely that also, in consequence, if any such step were taken, there will be retaliatory military assault against Israel from not only Iran but other nearby uh Arab countries. Look, I mean, we, we began this discussion this evening, Milt, by discussing the fact that over the past weekend, over 100 mortars and other projectiles already, yes. have landed in uh, leftist, uh, in leftist, in uh, southern Israel. Yeah. And that um, we're, we are facing an escalation military assaults on Israel and the Golan Heights from Syria. So, you know, we're, we're not talking about a situation that's happening in a vacuum. The violence is ongoing and it's escalating. And the one uh, positive aspect of Hezbollah's uh, attack on Israel during the 2006 war is that we saw what an all-out assault by them on Israel looks like, and it was very hard, but uh, they, we didn't encounter any sustained economic or other damage from it. All right, thanks to the caller, we're about to pause. A quick last round of capitalist uh, propaganda. That is, um, we're going to... Uh, hear from some of our sponsors and then directly back to the phones and some interesting email that has come in. 312-591-7200, the number. And for email, extension 720 at wgnradio.com. Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. And we return to Carolyn Glick, uh, who is, among many other things, a leading person at the Jerusalem Post, um, but you also write that you write there, of course, in English. But you also write in Hebrew yeah. for what is Makor Rishon? Uh, Makor Rishon, actually, I don't write for them right now. Uh, you but, used to. Uh, I used to be, yeah. be their senior uh, writer, but um, it's a uh, conservative newspaper in Israel. Mm-hmm. We go back to the phones three one two five nine one seventy two hundred. Jack joins us. Good evening, sir. Yeah, hi, how you doing, Milk? Just fine. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, you know, a lot of Americans in the world wonder why. We should support Israel. There was a show on, on cable on demand called Inside Israel, a documentary about 38 minutes. Mm-hmm. And it shows how uh, the inventions that Israel has given us, the electric car, uh, the cell phone, all the medical technology and computer technology. I think the whole world should see it, these Americans. That's why Israel is important to us and the world. Caroline, is it true that Israel gave us the cell phone? Yeah, Israel yeah. did the the initial uh, development of uh, I, cellular technology. I didn't know that. And the computer, <laughs> a lot of uh, the stuff. I mean, the the uh, microchip mm-hmm. was developed in Israel. And also, there was a guy, a quadriplegic, who invented some kind of outfit. If you're paralyzed, you can't walk. Well, uh, you can walk, but you know, you, one person he can't use it because he has no arms. If you have arms. It's, it's just amazing. You guys should see it if you have cable. No, I think it's it's very important to understand all of the things that Israel has done and all of the incredible things that Israelis are developing today and have been. Look, I'm, I'm a Jew, and I didn't, I didn't know that. Somebody told me that, and I watched the movie a couple of weeks, the documentary a couple of weeks ago. I think it's important. I think what you're saying is very important, and I also think that it's important to understand why it is that Israel is able to develop these kinds of things. Because I think that's really the root of why Israel and the United States are such close allies. It's because of the habits of freedom and liberty that enable people to engage in this kind of cutting-edge, pioneering work in science and in technology, the basic science. I mean, in order to, to develop these sorts of things, you have to have a free society. You never saw things like this coming out of communist Russia, despite oh, the fact that they had no great mathematicians there, because it's it's you need a base of liberty in order to enable this kind of, of pioneering. 
And so I think that it's that cultural basis more than anything else that makes Israel an indispensable ally for the United States in the Middle East. How did the big shift come in Israel? It was a socialist country. Yeah. And it turned into a very significant modern capitalist country. Uh, how, how did that happen? I think that the main impetus for Israel's massive shift was the uh, mass uh, immigration, the mass aliyah of uh, uh, Russian Jews, of Jews from the former Soviet Union and beginning in the 1970s. And then a massive wave came after <laughs> the fall of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s. And so we had over a million people coming into Israel from 1988 until uh, 19, uh, until 2000. So you, know, you had uh, – it has had a dramatic impact on Israel in every way because when people are coming out of closed societies and entering into free societies, particularly when they're educated like the Soviet Jews were, are um, – they just – all of the things that they've – that have been repressed inside of them for so many decades under under totalitarian regime, is it's just opened up and they transformed Israel in an incredibly positive way. Very interesting. So interesting. People raised under socialism but with good education. Well, they, especially in the math and sciences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially because it's the basic math. I mean America – had much more technological prowess than the Soviet Union did. But the Soviet Union, because of their lack of technological prowess, uh, spent a lot more uh, resources in developing basic skills in math and, and, in, uh, and in the exact sciences. Of course, some American Jews have had considerable influence as well in turning Israel in the direction it's gone. Netanyahu is not an American, but he was raised in America. Yeah, to a large extent, because his father, the late Ben Sion Netanyahu, taught at American University. Yeah, at Cornell, I believe. And the, the last university he taught at and his tenured professor was in Cornell, yes. Yeah. We go back to the phones, 312-591-7200, and Robert is our next caller. Good evening, sir. Hello, are you there? Yeah. Please proceed, sir. Yes, Robert, go ahead. Robert, yes. <clears throat> well, I'm half German, quarter Sweden, and quarter English. And my question, and I don't know if I have any Jew in me or not, but I just want to know why is Israel uh, <clears throat> so special that they're allowed to have the atomic bomb and nobody else in the region is? Well, are they that more, are they that more responsible? Is have, there no way to... I think that that's uh, an interesting question, it? and I think that it's important to understand that... Um, you know, one one of the things that uh, the Obama administration has been saying about uh, the the deleterious impact of an Iranian bomb on the region is that in, if Iran gets the bomb, then you're going to have an immediate nuclear arms race. And Israel has been an undeclared nuclear power since the 1950s, and you've never had an arms race because uh, uh, Israel's uh, atomic uh, arsenal, such as it is, um, is a is not a destabilizing. Um, ingredient in the region and you know that i think you know when when you look at how destabilizing everybody not just israel but the united states the europeans all perceive iran's nuclear uh a program and you compare it to the fact that nobody perceives mm -hmm. israel's uh nuclear uh arsenal or undeclared nuclear arsenal as as deleterious to regional uh stability and peace you just from that alone, and we don't have that much time. So just uh, suffice it to say that well, that alone makes clear I, the difference. Could I state? I think the reason sure. that we went into Iraq and have a, Afghanistan is because of the fact that Pakistan got the bomb. Mm -hmm. Pakistan got the bomb, and if it transfers towards the west, it's going to end up in Iran. It's going to end up everywhere. And I think that's the only reason we were over there fighting. We thank you, sir, for sharing that opinion. And let me read you an email I have <clears throat> from a listener in Nashville, Tennessee. Mark, who says, who asks, from your guest's knowledge of history and her experience in talking with older Israeli leaders, what U.S. president is generally considered to have had the best policy towards Israel? What U.S. president has had the worst policy? And why? I think that... Uh Lyndon Johnson is considered to be the most pro-Israel American president. Because it was under Johnson in uh, 1967 that the United States began its strategic alliance with Israel. It was, it was under Johnson that the United States began selling arms to Israel in 1968. Um, and Johnson was also supportive of Israel, both 
uh, before and after the Six-Day War. He didn't interfere with uh, Israeli operations uh, during the war. He didn't uh, interfere with uh, Israel's decision to preemptively attack Egypt in order to prevent its own destruction on the, at the hands of Nasser and his army. Um, and so to that degree, I think it's, it's pretty widely recognized that LBJ was was most pro-Israel president. And it's it's basically uh, universally, not universally, it's overwhelming majority of Israelis believe that the most anti-American, anti-Israel American president is Obama. Really? Why? Because why I mean, is that believed? You know, it, until Obama, I think that there was a there was a competition uh, between uh, Eisenhower and Carter, and uh, and since Obama came in, uh, he he outpaced both of them in people's assessments for two reasons. One is because he he has such an expressed animosity towards Israel, and in the way that he's uh, been contemptuous to our democratically elected government and leader. I mean, it's not personal towards Netanyahu. Netanyahu was elected by the Israeli people. It's not somebody who comes in and oppresses the country. It's somebody who represents the country. And so when you are nasty to Netanyahu and you treat him poorly where, in the where White was the House, nastiness? Was there, there was that one occasion where uh, he didn't uh, meet with Netanyahu in New York despite they're all being there for the UN, but yeah. Instead. But aside from that, I mean, he had him over in the White House. He forced him to come in through the back door. He didn't feed him dinner, yes. and when uh, they asked for food, uh, they gave them unkosher food. Uh, and he left in the middle to go have dinner with uh, his wife and children. And uh, I mean, there are just any number of occasions where he was extraordinarily <clears throat> nasty and contemptuous to Netanyahu. And then on the other hand. Uh, he's been incredibly supportive towards Israel's worst enemies in the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, in the Palestinians. The Turks increasingly are, are hostile to Israel, and it seems that the more hostile they are to Israel, the more Obama uh, relies on the advice and opinion of the Turkish leader, uh, Recep Erdogan. So, you know, I think it's a combination of his empowerment of Israel's uh, enemies and his and his uh, hostility towards uh, Israel that mark him really as, as the most openly, certainly hostile American president towards Israel. Well, there is also the American State Department. There's also uh, the... Uh, uh, I think, though, it's important to note that uh, you know LBJ was not alone. Most American presidents have been very supportive and friendly towards Israel. Yeah. Well, indeed, the establishment of Israel uh, that depended a great deal upon uh, American commitment to that establishment. Surely depended upon... Truman's quick and early recognition of Israel. Well, I mean, the United States didn't help Israel in in uh, in, in de- beating back the five uh, no, they didn't Egypt- fight the, five, five Arab armies that invaded the country. They didn't fight the war, to be sure. And they didn't allow they didn't sell arms to Israel until 1968. So I mean, it's not that Israel owes its independence to the United States. The United States didn't do anything active to enable it. Well, we come we have come to the end of the available time. This has been, for me, a fascinating discussion. The one thing I did not really press you on is what is to be done about the Palestinian Authority and about the Palestinian demand for a state and for autonomy. Well, I'm writing a book about that, so when I'm done, you can have me back and we can talk exclusively about that, if you like. Uh, by all means. You, this will be your first Chicago stop. There, there you go. Absolutely. You promise that, do you? I do. Thank you so much. Our guest has been Carolyn Glick. Um, and if you want to read her further, just go to our website, carolynglick.com, or go to the Jerusalem Post though she'll be uh, unavailable for a few months because she's finishing that book (laughs) that we've just been talking about. And we will not be unavailable. We'll be available, and we'll be here tomorrow night with something of considerable interest but quite different in focus. We're going to be talking with three restaurant critics who will tell us about what's edible and what's inedible uh, in uh, the newly opened restaurants, and for that matter, what persists and deserves to persist, and what has failed and deserved to fail. And overall, our yearly view of the restaurant scene in Chicago tomorrow night at 10. Until then, thanks to all for listening and a most cordial good night.